So before we start talking about actually visualizing amounts and proportions, um, I want to briefly talk about the principle of reproducibility in scientific analysis and why we actually care about this and why we're implementing reproducible practices with R in our data visualization class. Um, so it kind of goes to the heart of this question, which some of you might be asking yourselves, why am I even making you do all of this hard work? Um, especially um, if you've started doing the exercises that deal with group by and summarize. Um, if you've ever done anything with Excel, um, you know that that's essentially pivot tables. Um, what I'm teaching you how to do with R when you're grouping by specific columns and then summarizing and getting counts or averages um, or other summary statistics. Excel lets you do the same thing with pivot tables. You just drag um, these different fields into the columns and rows and values, and it creates these summary tables here for you, um, just like in R. And so why go through all the hassle of typing all of this stuff out and learning how to code when you can just make a pivot table really quick by hand? Um, that's a good question. So um, I, I propose that there are three answers to that question. Um, first, R in general is more powerful, um, in part because like we're not gonna cover everything R can do, um, but one thing you can do with group by and summarize, for instance, um, is it's possible to run regressions on each of the um, things that you group by in a, in a table in R. Um, so in a pivot table, all you can really do with this values section is you can get averages, you can get minimums, you can get maximums. Um, one thing you can do with R is if you have a big data set like that Gapminder data set where you have a whole bunch of rows for different countries across a whole bunch of different years, you could theoretically group by each of those countries and one, run one regression model that would then go over all 180 countries simultaneously. And then you can pull out different values like the regression coefficients or the R squared or different model statistics, um, all with like two lines of code. Um, and Excel can't do that. Um, so that's part of the reason you can do a lot more powerful things, especially when we get into more ggplot stuff. Um, Excel nowadays can kind of do maps, but it's not super advanced. Um, you can do some text analysis with R or with Excel, but not a lot. And so in general, it's kind of a more powerful professional grade tool. Second reason is that R is free and open source. And this kind of gets at the philosophical reason for making you use R. Excel, even though it's kind of used by businesses all over the world and governments all over the world, it's not technically free. You have to pay for it. Um, if you do a fancy analysis and save it as an XLSX file and then send it to a colleague um, who doesn't have access to Excel, um, is perhaps working in a, in a nonprofit that doesn't have access to the whole Microsoft suite, um, or is working um, in a developing country that um, for a developing country's government that doesn't have access to these programs, um, they're not going to be able to open the, the data that you send them. Um, also, um, if you learn how to do fancy things in, in programs like Tableau or Stata, um, as soon as you graduate from this program, you don't have access to those programs anymore. If you want to get Stata, it's like thousands of dollars a year for a license. Um, and so lots of like think tanks and big businesses will have access to Stata and Tableau and more expensive software, but the majority of companies that are small don't. And so you'll learn all these really cool skills and then never be able to use them again in the future. And so by learning open source free stuff, you can keep doing this, um, this R work even after you graduate, um, which is really cool. Um, the third reason is for scientific reasons. And this gets at the heart of science. Um, when you learn about what science was back in third grade, um, the basic process of science is that you have some sort of hypothesis, you run an experiment, and then you try to reproduce that experiment, and other people can do the same experiment and get the same results. And so as long as that happens, then you have reproducible science, and we can guarantee that things are true. Um, gravity is true. We can prove it through reproducible um, experiments. Um, social science is facing... Um, kind of a reproducibility crisis right now, um, where there are lots of um, social scientific studies that come out. Somebody pays for a national survey, um, gets lots of questions in there, finds really interesting things, but then they don't have funding to do it again and again and again um, because it's really expensive. And so um, we don't know if everything is perfectly reproducible. Um, we also care about replicability. Um, often when you do analysis, if you're doing it in Excel and you want somebody to be able to create the exact same results that you did, 
The only way that's going to happen is if you write down a list step by step of every menu that you clicked on and every cell that you right clicked on and changed and formatted so that they can do the same process on their side. Um, and that's hard and complicated and nobody ever does that. I've never seen an Excel sheet that has an accompanying um, list of instructions for here's all of the steps that we did to create this. Um, you just have to trust that it's done well. And that's where it gets kind of dangerous, this idea of trusting that everything's working. Um, so kind of a cautionary tale about this, there was a, an economics paper that came out in 2010 uh, by two um, economists, uh, Carmen Reinhart and Kenneth Rogoff. And they found, um, they were interested in, in looking at um, national debts um, and deficit levels. And they found that countries that had a high debt to GDP ratio, and so if, if a country has lots of, is leveraged with lots of debt and their, um, um, their national debt levels and national deficit levels are really high, um, what they found is that GDP growth decreases uh, by negative 0.1%. And so having lots of government debt is a bad thing, is what they, they concluded from their um, research here. And this was in 2010, which was right at the very tail end of the Great Recession. And at this time, tons of governments were spending lots of money and taking out lots of debt um, to help recover from the different recessions. And so after this paper came out, um, lots of policymakers saw it and said, wait, we need to not do this. We need to not have high debt levels in countries because it's going to hurt GDP growth. And so officials in Greece and in Ireland and in other countries in Europe that were facing um, economic crises because of the Great Recession, um, they started implementing austerity measures um, in part because of research like this. Um, even in the United States, um, so this, um, in 2013, the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, he published this House budget report, or budget resolution, and they cite the Reinhardt Rogoff paper, um, saying that we countries with high levels of debt need to not have high levels of debt because it's bad for GDP. Um, and so it became kind of the, the general consensus to not do lots of government spending because it would be bad. Um, so, good, important economic policy coming out of this paper. They did economic analysis. They found these results. Um, until this guy came along. This is Thomas Herndon. He was a graduate student in 2010 and 2011. Um, and one thing that PhD students often have to do in their methods classes, and half of you are PhD students, and so hopefully you've been have required to do this as well, um, is you have to replicate a paper. Um, you choose some paper out in the world and you contact the authors and say, hey, can I see your data? Um, and can I see your code? And then hopefully they share that with you and then you run all of the data and code on your computer and see if you get the same results. Um, nowadays, lots of authors will share their data and code. Some journals require that you have to um, post a link to your code somewhere online and you have to provide the data if it's not sensitive and contains personal information. Um, but these are fairly recent practices in part because of what happened to this guy here. So Thomas Herndon, he was interested in replicating the Reinhardt Rogoff paper. So he emailed the um, researchers and heard nothing back from them. And so he emailed again and emailed again and finally um, heard back from them and got the data. And surprisingly found out that he could not replicate the data. Um, so what's interesting, so Paul Krugman here, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist and opinion writer for the New York Times, he wrote about this, this problem that happened. Um, what, Her what Thomas Herndon discovered was that there was no negative effect on the debt or on GDP growth if countries had high um, debt to GDP ratios. Um, he only discovered that because Reinhard Rogoff allowed him to look at it. And so I have that highlighted there because that was kind of the prevailing attitude at the time is you had to... Um, decide if the person wanting your data was worthy to get your data. Um, nowadays, it's becoming more of a norm to just share your data, and also because of this here. Um, so what, what he discovered was that they had made a big error in their analysis. Um, he discovered that they didn't use STATA, they didn't use SPSS, they didn't use R, they didn't use kind of an official statistical package to do their analysis. Um, they used Excel to do their analysis. And this was the main finding from their um, paper here. This is table one. It shows the debt to, GD debt to GDP ratios for a whole bunch of different countries from 1790 to 2009. And so they're able to trace 
um, economic growth during different periods when there were high debt and low debt ratios. Um, and so here's the fancy table that they found. Um, what Herndon discovered when he looked at the Excel file, and because he, he put it in a regular statistical package and was getting a different number. So he opened the Excel file and found that whoever had coded the analysis in Excel, when they said like equals sum of a specific set of rows um, and specific set of cells, they accidentally omitted five rows. Um, these five rows here, Australia through Denmark. And so in their calculations to figure out that negative 0.1% um, decrease in growth, um, they omitted like five of the countries here. And so Herndon added those five back in and what he found was that having a high debt to GDP ratio actually boosts your GDP growth by like 2.2%, um, which is like the exact opposite of what the, the paper was originally arguing, um, which is a pretty dramatic switch in policy there. Um, so uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff still stand by their results. They have other um, results that kind of disprove this, and so it's an ongoing battle. Um, but in part, like all these austerity measures that were implemented around Europe um, were based in part on an Excel error. Um, it was really hard to, to find because um, the, auth the, the researchers didn't use kind of best practices for reproducibility. Um, and it, they just forgot to drag enough cells out to calculate the sum. So that was like dangerous. Um, Excel can also make serious errors with data. Um, and one good recommendation whenever you're working with uh, data files is to actually like avoid opening anything in Excel if you can. Um, because even sometimes if you just open a file to look at it and then close it, um, Excel will sometimes autosave if you have that feature enabled and it can mess up columns and, and data in your data set. For instance, in the genetic world, in biology, um, there are a whole bunch of different genes that have fancy names like this, septin2, and the membrane associated ring finger gene, um, or this fancy gene label that looks like that. Um, what's fun about these things is when you type them in Excel, or their abbreviations in Excel, you get all sorts of weird um, results. So with septin2, the abbreviation is sept2, but if you type that into Excel, it's going to think it's a date and change it to September 2nd. Um, this membrane associated ring finger um, uh, gene right here is the abbreviation is March 1. And so that naturally gets turned into March 1st. This number here is a little bit tricky. Um, it's a regular number and then it has this E and then it has 13. That's just the way they use the labeling system in genetics. Um, but in Excel and in math in general, this E has a special meaning. Um, you may have seen it in R already. Um, when there are lots of zeros involved, um, you'll see this E and it essentially means move the decimal point 13 places to the right. Um, if this was E negative 13, it would mean move the decimal place 13 places this way. And so if you have a really tiny P value in R, you'll see something like 0.2 e negative 16 and that means move the decimal point so there's like 15 zeros. Um, so this is technically just text but when you type it into Excel, Excel will turn it into a giant number and so this is now 2.31 but you move this decimal point 19 places this way so there's a whole bunch of zeros which is wrong and so if a bunch of your genes change from actual genes into dates and then you do a genetic analysis um, your analysis script is going to drop all of the genes that are dates because it doesn't know like it doesn't know what to do with those so it gets rid of them um, and then that skews the results and so one analysis a couple of years ago found that 20 percent of genetics papers published um, between 2005 and 2015 had issues with um, their data turning into dates and to incorrect numbers instead of genes which is kind of a scary amount of papers that had serious data issues um, and it's mostly caused by just opening a thing in Excel and then saving it and closing it in Excel. Um, so don't put stuff in Excel, it's dangerous. So the general guidelines for reproducibility in general is try to never touch the raw data. And if you do, explain what you did. Um, write it down in a, in a separate file somewhere. Um, I've been trying to get you into the habit of doing this somewhat. So when you create a new project, I have you put a CSV file or an Excel file or whatever the data is in a separate folder named data. 
Um, if you want to be super fancy, you can create a subfolder within data and call one raw data and one cleaned up data. And so you put the raw data files that you download straight from the internet into the raw data folder and never touch it again. Um, and then you use R to read it in as a CSV file, um, do a whole bunch of mutating and filtering and grouping and summarizing, doing all of your clean stuff. And then you can actually write that cleaned version as kind of the, the final nice, clean, pristine version and put that in your data folder, but not in the same folder as the raw data. Again, never touch that, um, just so that you have a, a clear record of everything that you're doing to your data set. And then you'll have a nice, clean data set and you can do whatever you want with it, but leave the raw, pristine data as protected and safe as possible. Um, another guideline is to use self-documenting reproducible code. Um, this is why you're using R Markdown. Um, when you have an R Markdown document, it has all of the text explaining what you're doing as you're typing, um, but then it also has the code embedded directly in the document um, if you knit it with the code turned on. And so anybody can look through that document and understand what was going on. You'll make decisions about how you're cleaning your data, or analyzing the data, or visualizing the data. Um, you'll explain that in your actual text, um, but then in the code, they can see what you did. And if if they see that you accidentally missed five countries, um, that should be way more apparent in the code than it is in some hidden Excel cell somewhere that happens to not cover all of the countries in the data. And so anybody can can look at your R Markdown file and follow the code and know what's going on, and it's kind of open to the public, which is good for reproducibility. And then the last um, guideline here is to use open formats as much as possible. So if you're using a spreadsheet, um, use Excel, that's fine to do data entry as long as you're not doing stuff with genes or doing any actual analysis, um, like trying to impose austerity on countries. Um, but when you're sharing that data, try to share it in formats that anybody can use. A CSV file is a spreadsheet. Every time you try to open it on your computer, Excel will want to open it and it can open it and it shows everything as rows and columns. But really underneath um, all of that, a CSV file is just a text file. If you open that CSV file in a program like Notepad or TextEdit, um, you'll just see that it's just regular text that is all separated by commas. That's the C for its comma separated values. And so anybody that has a text editor can open your data and do stuff with it. Um, Excel files, you can't open them in a text editor and see everything. And so it's, it's more proprietary and more closed off. So pay attention to that when you're sharing stuff. Um, Finally, this R Markdown stuff that you're doing, as frustrating as it might be initially, and you'll eventually get used to it, it is also the industry standard for places like um, Silicon Valley startups and government agencies. So Airbnb a couple of years ago uh, published a, a paper explaining their whole internal workflow for doing data analysis and data visualization. And um, so if you click on this link, you can see their paper. Um, but if you look at these paragraphs here, they use ggplot um, in-house to do all of their graphics, and they do all of their analysis in R Markdown, where they can combine code and visualizations and everything in one report. So Airbnb is doing this. Most uh, large Silicon Valley companies with analytic arms do either um, R Markdown or if they're using Python, there's a way to do it with Python as well. And so like, this is standard stuff. Um, the British government also does this. They have an office, they have a statistical office um, that helps with statistics for all of the different um, ministries. Um, and they do the same thing. They have, if you look at this blog post here, you can click on this link and see it. Um, they explain their whole process. That This used to be the way you did it. You got data from somewhere, some database hosted by some government agency. Then you use statistical software like SPSS or Stata to analyze it. Um, then that creates like spreadsheets with regression tables, and then you copy those, put them into Word, and then save the Word file as a PDF, and then publish it on gov.uk. Um, nowadays, they use R Markdown to directly access um, databases, and then they do all of the analysis and the figure creation and everything else here in R Markdown, and then they post the PDF or the HTML file on gov.uk, and anybody can access it. So it's a far simpler um, pipe or a far simpler pipeline, and there are a, a far fewer places for them to stick errors in there. Um, you're not going to accidentally miscopy something from the spreadsheet to the word processor. You've probably run into this in your own work if you've ever used Stata. If you have a complicated paper and you have like 10 
or 15 or 20 extra tables in your appendix. Um, anytime you update anything, you have to remake those tables and then make sure you reinsert them individually into Word. And if you miss one, then oops. Um, and that, that can be hard and complicated and time consuming. Um, but with our markdown, it happens um, just when you click a button, it'll recreate everything for you. And so those are kind of the best practices for doing this reproducibility stuff. It's why I'm subjecting you to learning our markdown um, so that you can create reproducible publicly accessible um, analysis and visualizations and hopefully make better science and better graphics.